Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you are. My name is Michael, and I will be uh, your moderator for today. This is the University of U Online Miami, and we are live. Um, and today we have a very special guest uh, with us talking about how 9-11 impacted global financial markets. We're going to look at how um, a crisis event has impacted the financial markets um, in 2011. And we're going to look at what are some of the reasons that um, that this specific uh, specific event has impacted uh, the, the markets in that specific context. We're going to also look further to see how similar crisis events might also affect um, either today or in the, the future, uh, the global financial markets, as you well know that it is a very intertwined uh, global system and is always very susceptible to, um, to all sorts of factors. Um, with this in mind, uh, bear with us for the next half an hour. Uh, I hope that you're going to find it as, uh, as interesting as I will because it's quite a, an intense topic and it's quite a lot of information. And because we want to see, you know, what's your perspective on the topic and um, if you have any questions, we want to address them. This is an open Q&A webinar. So we will have um, a short segment towards the end of the webinar where we can pick a couple of questions that you have and address them live with our key speaker today. So with this in mind, I would like to introduce um, our speaker for today, the um, expert, let's say, in, in international financial markets. Uh, we are going to talk with Michael first. Uh, he is an associate professor um, on the finance um, master's program here at the University of Miami Online. Uh, Michael first's ex expertise include financial markets and institutions and international corporate governments. He's done a lot of research, especially, especially with today's uh, topic, and he's been um, published in a lot of economical profile magazines. He's appeared on CNBC uh, to discuss his research on, on seasonal stock returns, anomalies, and training strategies. Um, and Michael has an extensive teaching experience included, including international and corporate finance at both the graduate and undergraduate levels, and as well has developed courses for the online master's degree here at the University of Miami U Online. Uh, with this in mind, I would like to welcome Michael. Hello, Professor First. How are you? Hello, Michael. How are you today? Very fine, thank you. Can you uh, tell us where you're broadcasting from and just um, a few information about your connection with the University of Miami U Online? I am uh, broadcasting from my office uh, on campus at the business school here in, uh, in Florida. Uh, I have uh, I've been with the business school coming up uh, 20 years this August, uh, and um, I, I'm um, very much engaged in the U Online program, both developing courses, teaching in the program, and promoting it uh, as a, an excellent way to master uh, the field of finance. Brilliant. And today we're actually going to talk uh, about one of your specific research that you co-authored with uh, team Tim Birch and Doug Emery, who are also part of the finance uh, online master's faculty uh, members. Um, and of course, because we want to give our audience an idea of what the um, research was about, can you just give us a bit of information on this synopsis and what did you, what were you looking for when you actually started to do the research? Yes, um, th this was, uh, yes, my, my colleagues, uh, uh, Doug and Tim, were uh, instrumental in, in this paper. And, um, we uh, were interested in looking at the role of investor psychology. In particular, we were looking, interested in looking at the, the role of individual investors versus institutional investors. We were interested in seeing if their trading pattern differed. Uh, when there were informational events, news, and specifically major events and crises. Um, we were interested in understanding whether or not there was a potential for correlated irrationality or a, a panic response, a flight response, uh, which is discussed in psychology. And we were interested in seeing if that played a major role in 
in the returns and the reaction of stocks, stock prices to this new information, and if that differed from institutional trading. Um, the common uh, belief um, has been that any irrationality in the market by, say, individuals uh, would be um, mitigated through the actions of more rational institutional traders. Um, we were interested in actually comparing both the trading patterns and uh, to see the relevant uh, relative influence in price changes uh, based on the trading of those two uh, clientele in the market. And we were quite interested in the results, quite surprised even, in that when there is a market-wide crisis and a large release of new information potentially, um, individual investor trading uh, can overwhelm and dominate the trading by institutional investors. Specifically, after the markets reopened after 9-11, uh, individual investors were uh, initiating sell trades in a panic fashion, but uh, those were the individuals, but the institutions were buying, but their buying could not offset the downward movement of uh, all stocks and most securities. They were simply overwhelmed by the trading by, done by individuals. And um, uh, that was not a, a result that uh, would have been easily anticipated. Okay, and why 9-11 specifically? What draw your attention to this event? Well, we needed an event uh, that had um, a significant impact, uh, a large amount of potential new information being released, and one that was essentially irrefutable with regards to being significant. Uh, and that then created a natural experiment. That sad day uh, provided an opportunity to study trading patterns when there was a significant uh, informational event. Um, so it provided the natural experiment and it was clearly the type of event that we were interested in analyzing and no one would argue against that. Okay, and, and by the time that you've actually looked into this research, have you uh, come across or have you seen any other authors publishing something similar, looking at other global crises and seeing you know, how, how the behavior of the market changes? Well, the impact of this paper was that it was one of few, if any, to demonstrate um, the impact that retail or individual investors can have on the market. And that then provides a piece of the puzzle to understanding in great detail how markets function. So this paper then is cited as providing support uh, for the potential impact of retail investors on stock price movements. Um, closely related to this is that with the increase of retail trading in the market, we should logically expect greater volatility in prices, certainly around major news events, market-wide events. So the volatility is in part due to a larger presence of individuals. Okay. Um, and, you know, based on the research that you did, what was the immediate impact that you've seen uh, following the 9-11 uh, incident? So what have you noticed uh, within the individual behavior of, of uh, the, the private investors? Well, after the markets opened, six days following the event, um, the prices of uh, stocks of all sizes and, and types were driven massively down. Um, and the, the universal loss in value was driven despite institutional buying. Uh, after that period, in the following two to three weeks, there was a significant uh, recovery. And that rate of recovery was influenced primarily by two factors. One, as I've indicated already, the presence of retail investors. 
Um, for example, very small stocks are predominantly traded by small investors. Those were exceedingly slow to recover, and those were the same ones that reacted most significantly to 9-11. Um, so the, re the reaction and recovery is related to that one factor, uh, the presence of institutional, uh, sorry, the lack of institutional trading and the dominance of individual investors. And secondly, on the quality of information, the, um, the prices returned more quickly for securities for which there was better information. Um, we draw a uh, nice comparison that shows both the overreaction uh, and the recovery uh, by looking at closed-end funds. Those are different than the open-end mutual funds most people think of. The closed-end fund is a, uh, a security that trades on the market. And essentially, you can think of it as a, uh, a small firm and all they own are stocks. And this trades on the market like a share. And um, that provides an interesting opportunity to explore uh, the impact and recovery for crises based on differences in both information and in traders. Uh, the reason is the closed end funds are owned overwhelmingly by individuals, but the underlying securities are owned overwhelmingly by institutions. And so we track the price reaction and the logical response of moving in tandem did not appear. Individual investors drove down the prices of closed-end funds well below the value of the underlying stocks or assets that the closed-end fund held. So individuals owning closed-end funds caused large price drops and overreaction relative to the fundamentals determined by the underlying stock. And that then provides uh, quite direct evidence of overreaction. And the recovery, if you compare the recovery of the, of the underlying versus the closed end fund, um, you'll see that the amount of reaction and recovery, uh, first of all, was less and more, but more quick for the underlying that we looked at, which were primarily US government securities held by closed end funds. So the recovery, the reaction and the recovery was less when there was more information. The information here is very positive. The U.S. government was fine. The U.S. government's values of those bonds would certainly hold their value post 9-11. And so in total then, heavy presence of individual investors coupled with little information is essentially a, the two dimensions that lead to overreaction and slow recovery. And how long, uh, in your observation, did, uh, did it take for the institutional investors to re-stabilize the market? Um, it depends on which stocks you look at. If you look at the stocks that um, uh, are traded primarily by institutional investors, their recovery was um, in about two to three weeks um, after 9-11. So the second uh, or third uh, week of trading after the markets reopened, you'll see a recovery there. However, if you look at very small stocks in the lowest decile or lowest couple deciles, the recovery there was extremely slow, uh, extremely slow. And these are the very stocks that have both a heavy presence of individual investors and there's less coverage, less information. And so they were hit hard by both of those factors. Heavy retail ownership coupled with less information available about them. So their recovery took um, many more weeks. Okay. And uh, since 9-11, in your knowledge, have you seen similar events that have, have affected the global financial market in a similar way? Um, well, let me first say that uh, in the, the modern financial market, uh, a regular significant correction is to be expected. Our markets these days are quite volatile. And uh, that is due in part to a greater presence of uh, 
individual investors. It's not the only reason by far, but it is one major component. And so we should expect that. We should expect greater volatility now and going forward than in the past. Um, the market corrections that we see uh, occurring regularly, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, all of those events are now going to be uh, reflected more severely in the market. But let's keep in mind that those are overreactions to some degree that it, it's very likely that things are much better than they appear and that a recovery will ensue. Certainly it will ensue much more quickly for um, stocks that have a heavy institutional trading presence and also for uh, uh, securities for which there's lots of information available. Uh, you can't continually price wrong if you have good information. So keeping calm during a crisis is really a one implication, a uh, practical one coming from the paper uh, and the research that we should expect volatility and that volatility uh, represents to a significant degree an overreaction and things will improve. So really, if you invest right prior, diversified, well-diversified portfolios, uh, et cetera. If you invest right, when a crisis hits and the markets react, overreact, really, you, you, things are better than they appear. Hold tight, the markets will recover. The markets will recover. Um, and in fact, there may well be buying opportunities during a, a major correction because of the overreaction. The values go below what we would call fundamental value, and there may well be buying opportunities. If, if an investor doesn't like this, and a lot of people don't, uh, then the other implication is shy away from owning stocks that are primarily held by individuals and less well-known or um, perhaps even obscure because those don't have good information. Owned stocks that maybe uh, are owned heavily by institutions and for which there's good information. That may, may well be captured by blue chips, well-known companies that are studied, studied thoroughly and owned heavily by institutions. Brilliant, thank you so much for that. Um, and of course, you know, uh, my curiosity as well is, You've already discussed about this um, this behavioral approach where individual investors need to make sure to stay calm and you know focus on the information that they have, try to receive as much information as, as they can. But what would you, how would you see this research being applied also in the future, uh, besides only these you know behavioral aspects um, that individual investors need to you know take on? Um. It means that large movements, overreactions, are to be expected. And the, their meaning is not as gr grave as you might once have supposed. There are deviations from fundamental values that can be uh, expected to occur on a regular basis. Uh, I'm not talking daily, but I'm talking every so many years. and one should expect those and be prepared for those. But if you're investing for the long haul, um, hold tight, everything, you'll be all right. Um, the markets will correct. So if you're invested upfront correctly, um, the corrections and overreactions that you will experience are to be expected, but um, things are most likely better may be much better than they immediately appear. Um, maybe even more practical. I think a big mistake is people that own stocks and risky assets who check their portfolio value every day. That, <laughs> that's not a good thing because we're all human. Remember, we're all individuals and we react to things that in a way that isn't necessarily always rational. Remember, we're in your an individual's typically investing for the long term, thinking in terms of many years. These corrections are transitory. So investing right and holding fast with your investment uh, 
and thinking long term um, really sh will serve one well in the markets. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing that, Michael. And uh, we have actually reached the Q and A section of uh, of our webinar. So again, for uh, our audience today, if you still have questions and if you have uh, things that uh, Michael can clarify for you, please make sure to write them in the Q and A box. Um, and we have the next uh, five minutes to go through some of the questions um, as they come. In the meantime, I do have uh, a first question prepared for, for you, Professor. So my question would be uh, more in terms of uh, the social, the so, sorry, the media, the media's um, responsibility within uh, these kinds of crisis situation. How much uh, should people rely on media when they get their information and how much media needs to be you know, aware that these kinds of reactive um, behaviors are dealt by what they also put as information for for uh, for people out there. Well, on one level, accuracy is important. I don't really see a problem with the media. They accurately quote index prices, daily reactions. Um, that's not the problem. Um, presenting a full picture uh, was beneficial, and I, I do see that. Uh, if there is a significant reduction in the value of, of the market in total, comparing that value now versus its peak maybe a month ago is not really a valid comparison. Look at the long term. After a crisis uh, and a correction, it's often the case that the price has fallen to a price that where the market was less than a year ago and everyone was happy with. That's a very common event. So taking a historical perspective and looking at the longer term trajectory, that sort of discussion, that, that sort of discussion could be calming in the markets and it's accurate. It's providing more information and perspective. Um, so I think that could be a benefit from the media. And I'm not claiming that isn't being done. If you, write, if you watch the right programs, you'll see people making those very uh, comparisons. So maybe tuning in to um, those who are informed, uh, those who have a knowledge of the markets uh, would be beneficial uh, in selecting media that is um, uh, soberly looks at performance over a longer period of time. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, I have a first question. Um, one of our audience members asked, uh, thank you pr professor for, for sharing your research. Um, how would you consider this research being applied to more modern financial markets? Um, and he refers to the, the cryptocurrency market and the blockchain technology behind. Would you say that, um, that this research can be applied as well in these kinds of markets? Well, the, 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 the answer is yes, because what we're studying is we're studying human behavior. And since humans trade stocks, and closed-end funds in the paper, uh, humans are also trading cryptocurrencies. And because of that, the movement in prices um, that will be similar, and the reactions of individuals will be similar. Now, with those markets, keep in mind that the fundamental value is not readily apparent. And so, we would expect to see wild gyrations in value and great um, volatility because you're trying to price where there is something uh, one currency versus another essentially and there really isn't um, uh, good quality information uh, and therefore large movements are to be expected. So that is the movements we see in these, these cryptocurrency markets are in, indeed perfectly consistent with what we find. Thank you so much. A second question actually goes back to one of your answers and someone wants to know, so Professor, you've mentioned blue chips investing companies. Can you be, can you give us more details on that? Well, what I was, was mentioning is that uh, Comparing stocks in the S&P 500, for example, with the smallest of stocks in the lowest decile, 
you are going to see a significant difference in the degree of reaction or overreaction to an event or a crisis uh, and a difference in the speed of recovery. Um, the S&P 500, for example, holds these well-known, well-covered stocks that are also owned and traded more by institutions. Um, small, uh, smallest decile stocks uh, are held overwhelmingly by individuals. And there's also little information uh, or less information, uh, less coverage of those small stocks. And consequently, we would expect to see significant, more significant overreaction uh, in small stocks and slower recovery because those measure strong on both of the critical dimensions, heavy retail presence coupled with less or less or lower quality information. Okay. Um, and I think this is going to be our final question within the time that we have. Um, Professor, did you notice any differences in recovery for ETFs versus mutual funds? Was there uh, research opportunities there as well? Well, we didn't look at mutual funds because their prices are priced based on, uh, on a daily basis relative to the stocks and, or the assets they hold. Closed-end funds are market-traded mutual fund equivalents. When you buy a closed-end fund, uh, you're investing in a, in a broad set of assets that that fund holds, and that, that closed-end fund trades. So we definitely, that was a central part of the analysis, looking at those closed-end funds uh, and comparing their uh, reaction, overreaction, and recovery to the actual underlying stocks. Now, the exchange-traded funds, um, those track better, uh, much, much better than closed-end funds because the ability to uh, arbitrage uh, or profit from the uh, difference in value between the underlying stocks or assets owned and the exchange-traded fund, that opportunity doesn't exist for closed-end funds. Uh, you can't buy a closed-end fund and then sell the assets it owns. You can only sell the fund in general. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor. Um, again, please go and uh, read the entire article in details. Just Google who moves markets in a certain market-wide crisis and you're going to find it. Um, I want to uh, give a big thank you to Professor uh, Michael First for uh, coming out today and, and sharing his research and sharing a lot of his knowledge over this topic. Thank you so much, Professor. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, and for uh, our audience out there, thank you for joining. Uh, this has been a University of Miami U online webinar, um, and I hope to see you again in other topical webinars as well. And in the, the meantime, I wish you the best of luck with uh, your endeavors. And I hope that you found this webinar uh, informative and uh, exciting as well. Have a good day. And thank you so much once again. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.